the GMI Online. We got the GMI Hub and we're presenting the Hub Online. Uh, tonight we're going to be covering a, a really good topic for those of us who are in the music industry. And some of us may have some great songs. And now what do you do? So that's, that's where we're at. My name is Dale Borland. And I'm Cheryl Duick, and we have three fabulous ladies with us that are going to talk to us about royalties and licensing. Emma um, from ReSound, come take off your mic and tell me the proper title. Sure. So it's Emma Julian or Julien, whatever you want, mm -hmm. uh, from ReSound, and I'm the industry partner specialist. Wonderful. Emma. Welcome, Emma. We love to have you here. And we also have... Rebecca Webster, thank you for joining us. She is Director of Industries and Relations and Communications from Canadian Musical Production Rights Agency. Say that three times fast. And finally, we have Kenkezia Myers-Carter, who's also with us. She is our licensing and copywriting royalty expert um, with a history of working with SoCan, um, now working in tandem with ReSound in a uh, in a, in a joint project called In Tandem. Yeah. And we're gonna learn more about that. Welcome, Kezia. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. So, so ladies, we're just gonna get going here. Um, we wanna talk about, um, we wanna clear all the confusion that may exist between royalties and licensing and copywriting. Um, so I'm gonna, just gonna start with First of all, if you can tell us a little bit more about what your, the focus of your organizations are. Okay, Kezia, start with SOCAN. Tell us what SOCAN is all about. I can tell you. So SOCAN is a collective. It's a performing rights organization. Uh, SOCAN is responsible for representing those who are part of the creative process in a in creating a musical work and if they are a songwriter or a producer they would be represented or members of SOCAN. Uh, SOCAN focuses on that piece which is the performance rights um, and the administration of that. They also do reproduction rights as of a couple years ago. Awesome, thank you so much Kezia. Emma, tell us about uh, ReSound. Sure. So ReSound is a national not-for-profit not organization uh, that represents performers on recordings and master owners. And uh, our members are uh, on the performer side, um, Actra Rax, MROC, and Artisti. And on the maker side or master owner side, Connect Music and Soprock. And uh, so we basically collect all of the neighboring rights royalties uh, in Canada, working now with in tandem as well to collect those and then distribute them via our, our members who I just mentioned or directly to uh, artists who choose to sign up with ReSound directly. Thank you. And Rebecca. Yeah, CMRA. So that's the Canadian Musical Reproduction Rights Agency. Um, we are also a collective uh, like the others uh, here. Uh, we're the market leader in reproduction rights in Canada. Um, so that is to say our clients are music publishers and music publishers typically have rosters of songwriters. And um, so you can sign up as a music publisher to CMRA or you can sign up as a songwriter who is not yet represented by a music publisher. You can sign up with us directly. Wonderful, awesome. Royalties, copywriting, licensing. Let's clear the definitions, the elephant in the room <laughs> kind of idea. So um, if someone has a song and is it copywriting that they need to do next? And if so, what are those steps? I'm not a lawyer, but um, in Canada, I believe that the copyright exists once you, you write the song. Yeah. So um, you don't have to worry about that part. What you do have to worry about is um, collecting the money afterwards. Um, and so this is why it's good for you to have assembled these people because you have to know what rights are implicated in the song. So the people who wrote the song um, deserve to be compensated. The people who perform the song deserve to be compensated. And there's a right in the, perf in the recording of the song as well. So um, we all work with different, um, different pieces of this pie. Um, CMRA in particular works with the reproduction right. So that is to say every time 
a song is reproduced onto a platform. It started out as mechanical um, reproduction, so meaning you would reproduce it physically onto a product of some kind, so maybe a cassette, a CD, a vinyl, um, even a USB key. And then it, because the digital platforms started to exist, the streaming services that, that most of you know, Beatport, SoundCloud, Apple, um, Spotify, um, then that reproduction right continued, but it was more in a digital world. So it, that was when the, the song is reproduced onto those platform servers. Anytime that situation happens, a royalty is generated. So what we do at CMRA is we collect that money for you and we then distribute it to, to you. So that's you, what you need to be concerned about. Well, you just said at the beginning of that conversation that copyrights automatic when you sing us, when you write a song. How, yeah. What do you mean? Like, how, how do I prove that I wrote that song unless I have a copyright? Split sheet. So if you, once it's written, uh, for, from a standpoint of SOCAN, for instance, we ask you to register that song. And okay. It, once it's recorded, that's when the copyright has already been enacted. The copyright then could be split between multiple people if there are multiple people who are part of the creation of that song. The best mm -hmm. thing to do is to, in those recording sessions, always have what we could call a split sheet. And that split sheet will help to identify the percentages of the copyright that are allotted to each person. Uh, in general, we look at the songwriter, the songwriting portion of a song being 50% and the production side of a song being 50%. So if there were two people, a producer or a composer and a songwriter, each would get 50% before being divided into the publisher, if, if a publisher represents any of these people. Mm. Um, but to keep it easy, we'll keep it at two. Um, and then if there were two songwriters, then we may divide that if they worked evenly together, we may divide that in 25% each, and then the composer or producer gets 50%. So that's how the copyright is then verified, or it's, it's on paper, um, and then you take that to your respective music rights organization to register it using those copyright percentages. Mm. And keep in mind that... Um, say you're Drake and you own, or I, I was like, I contributed an idea to a Drake song and I own 1% of that Drake song. That 1% could be very valuable. Yeah, it's yeah. probably more valuable than the song that you and I write together. Mm -hmm. um, so these percentages and these splits are, it's really important. It's a best practice. Don't leave that studio before you've written down these shares of songs. Right. There was a, there was a point of time whenever you, you could register mail and send the song to yourself and it would be like date stamped and is that still a thing for a copyright no. i don't know if we can rely on the postal service yeah <laughs> i don't know that i would rely on postal yeah <laughs> basically as soon as it's done register it onto your music rights organizations and they'll have a copy of it um, but just to Rebecca's point, if I can give an example, um, there is a song called Nice For What by Drake. And uh, the manager of the producer suggested that they use the Lauren Hill sample. And he gets a percentage of mm -hmm. that every single time. Wow. It, it amounts to, it, it adds up. Yeah. yeah. That's why this is also a business. <laughs> Music business, for yeah. sure. Wow, this is amazing. Okay, so so we've clarified now co copywriting, and, and I had the same question that Dale said. Which Good, was, perfect. Was, <laughs> yes, well, I was hoping you would ask that question because I thought, okay, copywriting, and, and uh, years ago, that's exactly what we did. We we mailed it to ourselves and said, okay, mm -hmm. that's our copyright. So yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so now, so now, if once it's been recorded, obviously the copywriting is taking place, and then they have to register it with the with their registering company, which in, in our, in Canada, that would be SOCAN, correct? SOCAN is just, is the, perf the permitted monopoly for uh, the performing rights. So exactly. that's in Canada. Yeah. Um, okay. There's lots of other, when we see that there's a piece of a pie, there's lots of other different um, organizations like CMRA, like ReSound, that you should be making sure that you're registering with. Um, uh, you know, essentially you need, you know, the, it's good to start with a platform of um, 
of making a habit of registering your songs across all platforms. Um, because as you become more prevalent within the industry, these are going to be very valuable to you. And you are going to care more about all three streams of income rather than one stream of income. So am I hearing you correctly in saying that you should go to more than one organization to register your song? Yeah. Well, we're, re we're representing different rights. Oh, fascinating. Oh. Yeah, so... I, I represent the reproduction of the song onto the streaming platforms, for example, and into the radio station. So I pay the music publishers who represent the songwriters, the people who wrote the songs. Kezia represents um, the performance of the song. So whoever performed the song. So they, they didn't necessarily write that song. So those are t like two distinct things. Then neighboring rights I'm going to give to Emma because That's that is fabulous. Favorite. <laughs> well, na wow. neighboring rights is the per the performance also. So there are two different types of performance. Also, there's per public performance, like live performance, and there is public performance of sound recordings. So um, resound, when it comes to neighboring rights, that's what resound is. It's the sound recording being used in public, um, whereas all of the live music, like if you're playing at the bar on the corner, that's going to go through SoCan, assuming it meets the designated criteria for a live show <laughs> with SoCan. <laughs> but, um, but basically, just to come back to making sure that everything's registered, um, yes, yeah, so you want to make sure that you are keeping your repertoire up to date. So, um, so essentially, you write a song, it by default belongs to you because you wrote it but you want to get it registered with SoCan as soon as possible once you record a song you want to get it registered with um resound or connect music or one of the member organizations that's going to represent you as the performer and or the master owner there's probably rebecca can weigh in here if repertoire needs to be kept up to date with cmra as well i'm not sure Yes, um, so you should, okay. at the same moment that you're registering with these organizations, you should register your songwriting with, with us because um, especially now, it's a good time to do it because um, the mechanical rights right now are still pretty um, strong. Um, hmm. Obviously, there's not as much performance happening in the world. Right, so, um, that's true. You know, people are still streaming songs, and those songs uh, deserve to get paid back to the songwriters. Okay, at this time, I just want to remind those who are watching at home, this is the, the GMI Hub presenting the Hub Online, and we are talking about, um, well, I guess, after you write the song, then what? You know, it's great opportunities. We have a SOCAM representative, Kazia um, Myers, she's here. We have Emma Julius, she's here um, from ReSound. And we have uh, the CMRRA, and that stands for Canadian Musical Reproduction and Rights Agency. And so we are so glad to have all these ladies on as we unpack this a little bit more, just to help you guys who are out there in the music industry to just figure out what you're doing and navigate around that. There's different types of licensing, like there's the public performance, there's the publishing, the rights, it's a royalty. Somebody help me out on this. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I will start with um, licensing the public performance uh, and that license is, as Emma had said, any live performance. Now that doesn't mean live in person necessarily, that could mean radio, that could mean on Spotify or a D DSP, which is your YouTubes, your Facebooks, um, any digital service provider, um, any listening a platform where we traditionally would have been radio may now be Spotify for you. So there's a live performance that happens in that case. Um, and then beyond that, some places where you don't think of live performance would be walking through the mall. Music is played. And so the mall is required to pay a license fee to SoCan and ReSound. And then as individual uh, performance collectives, we distribute that music back to the members that are, um, are to receive it. Um, other places where you wouldn't necessarily think of music being a licensable are bars or restaurants. 
all of these places have music. And so what we look at when we are licensing is how incidental the music is. So if it's incidental, that means it's in the background. The reason you're going to the restaurant is not necessarily for the music. They could have great music, but you're probably going to eat. Um, so that's so the music kind of stuff you might hear in the mall yeah, sometimes. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and unless you're going for a jazz show, which again, you're still probably going for a dinner date, let's say, um, versus going to a concert where that is integral. That is the reason you're going. So the license fee that we receive from a concert promoter is going to be a lot more than we do a business. However, when distributing that music, it all comes down through um, through a, an algorithm to create a royalty for those who've created the song. I want to go back to, the, the, there's two things that now have popped up, but I want to go back to the performance uh, part because with COVID being around, um, a lot of artists, some have, have shied away and said, well, I can't do anything because we can't perform live, but then some have been creative enough to, to actually do a performance on live stream like they they go on facebook and okay today i'm touring in my bathroom and you're going to hear these songs or something like that right so so what happens in that case like are they getting royalties because is that a performance royalty is that a streaming royalty how does that work awesome question so from the standpoint again of that public performance yes it is a performance and it is considered a live performance um any organization like let's say they're live streaming through a platform like Facebook for instance and I use that only because we're on Facebook now um, Facebook is responsible for paying a license fee and that license fee is distributed amongst music providers or music players um, over a duration of a quarter um, now we have to think about things and manage expectations the royalty you're going to receive from performance on Spotify or Facebook is going to be a fraction of a cent. Because what you do is you take the license fee that is paid to SoCan and you divide it by all of the streams that have come in that qualify as music. And maybe Kezia can confirm or deny what I'm saying, but I'm pretty sure that SoCan launched um, a program recently to compensate people who are doing live streams during, um, you know, isolation and staying home and everything. I think it's called Encore uh, mm -hmm. and it actually co compensates artists like they can apply to the program um, because there was kind of a, a gap there from going from being able to perform live and claim your live performances and everything like that through the regular so can streams um oh, okay. so i believe that that exists now i think it launched maybe mid-may um and if i recall it's just like um the stream has to have been accessed by a hundred people or something like that um for it to be eligible and then you can submit it and receive compensation for it i should Very also good. mention in terms of live streams um you know the people who are performing on these live streams are performing songs and uh, so therefore there is that implication of a reproduction um, in there um, but in our business we actually license the platforms so um, we have a deal in place with Facebook and Instagram and Oculus VR and that is um, coming back as a blanket license to our music publishers who are signed up so that is covered over in in, in that way um, it's we only unfortunately have licenses for those platforms right now. Um, the other ones are still under discussion with the music publisher community. Um, uh, Kezia would like to finish up some of the points she was trying to make. I think it was really imperative there. I think Emma probably answered the rest of the question. Well, she helped, yeah, very much. Yeah. Well, did, did we talk about licensing and its extent? Did we, did we finish that topic? Because I didn't feel like we did. We, we started uh, okay. talking. So then, yep, Not I really. can continue off there. So, um, as I was saying, there's that public performance of licensing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then there is also the licensing of a specific song. And this is where there's a little bit of confusion uh, within the industry because they, if you're using someone's song, for instance, if you're doing a cover by Beyonce and you put it on a public platform and then YouTube takes it down, it's because the, the licensing wasn't paid, not for the public performance, but because you're using music that you should be negotiating with a publisher on, 
to pay to use Beyonce's song. Now, if you if you are looking to license Beyonce's song, you should be calling CMRA because the chances are we work with 95% of the songs that are currently streamed, downloaded, or played in Canada. So chances are we are working with the publisher and we represent that song. If we don't, then we will direct you to the publisher to follow up with them directly. And there are certain songs that will never be allowed to be licensed, but um, that's, that's how you do it. Um, and if you, for instance, say you're actually um, putting a cover on one of your albums, you should be getting a license for that, for the pressing of that also. So um, yeah, it's good. We actually have on our website, we have a repertoire search. Um, mm. It's just a public um, thing that you can just use to give you a sense of direction. Um, and then you can call up and say like, okay, I'm, I'm looking to license Lady Gaga's song. And, right. and that falls under the category of publishing, does it? When you're talking about licensing, publishing a particular song. So music publishing is, is it, we represent songwriters, mm -hmm. um, so, um, rosters of songwriters. So okay. um, that, that is, that is, that is, I like to think of music publishers. This is the way I think of it because it, it, you know, there's a lot of different players in, in the industry I, as warriors of the song. Mm. Um, the reason they're so valuable is that they try and add value to that part of the business, to the songs. They will mm -hmm. try and set up sync licensing for their clients. They will try and maybe pair um, two great writers together to make an even better song oh, or to love the connection in the industry. Um, and uh, this is all just to make more money off of it or mm -hmm. um, make the world notice it. You know, it's really hard to get noticed these days. Uh, yeah. anything it takes so to administer the song so they're there to work with us to tell us all of the repertoire changes and and all of those things you have a song um, and you just want to have it available so that film people um, or movie people or um, youtubers who want just background music for their videos or whatever the case may be what licensing is involved with that so um, I think the first question you have to ask is whether you're going to be using it for commercial usage or non-commercial usage. If it's commercial usage, then, um, and say you're, you're pairing, um, you know, you're putting a, a song in a commercial for television and you're selling a product, that is actually sync. You're, you're performing a sync. So that's sync licensing. And then you have to go directly to the music publisher because that is very valuable. And, and um, but if it's non-commercial, um, then we as CMRA have negotiated licenses for say, say, say you're just like putting a fun video up on Facebook and it's got some music in it and you know, you're not generating any money from it we've covered it already. The songwriter will be compensated in a different way because we've got a blanket license with them. Hmm. I don't know if that answered it, but that was just sort of a starting thought of, you always have to think about how you use the song. So once it's commercially um, used, then it's a different implication. And there's, there's different platforms that can utilize your music and songs for those distributions. Is that how it works? Um, yeah, I mean, for instance, uh, last year, um, Facebook launched their music services and um, they worked with us because we worked with so many music publishers in Canada to get our clients on board to be able to launch those services. So if you've ever been on like, say, Instagram and in the Instagram stories, you can see um, that you can put in a song in there. Um, that's because we've been working very closely with our music publishers to get them to affiliate with us for this per particular usage of their musical works. And um, we update them every month and tell them these are now al allowed in your music library and now your consumers can just use these freely. Um, because the, the assumption of that license with them is that they're using them for non-commercial purposes. Okay. That's what the agreement, the, the lawyer, uh, the lawyers drew up is all about. I was just about to ask about music libraries, so I'm glad you kind of mentioned it. What I understood about music libraries is, I guess if you think of your song like a book, it's a place where someone can borrow 
the song, <laughs> right? So in a case like that, I was just kind of wondering, do music li libraries even exist for Canada or for Canadians? Or is this something that I've just heard from another country and I'm just curious about it, you know? I think what you're talking about is um, the music libraries that are available for sync licensing. Yeah, uses. yeah. Okay. Yeah, in that case, you're basically, you're, you're granting the, the rights to that administrator to, to allow certain people to have access to it. Exactly. You're essentially, you're performing, you, they're stand in for a music publisher in that, in that sense. They're, they're kind of, they're speaking on your behalf. Um, it, that is not like we don't do sync licensing at all because we consider that the right of the music publisher. So yeah, I'm out of that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would, I would add that um, if someone who's watching this like wants, really wants to get their music synced to film or television, um, someone they might want to look into working with is a music supervisor or look into um, companies that do music supervision that's really where that's all starts to happen. And music supervisors work with publishers who uh, know their, their catalog really well and their clients really well and are able to do that work of pairing them up, which is, mm. I think, Cheryl, what, what you were imagining when you're talking about like your friend's music that, ne that needs to be placed somewhere or needs to be like rented out for something. That's, um, largely where that happens ah. is between in that relationship between music supervisor and publisher and that it's a really good point um when i was on sort of the other side of the industry um sometimes it's hard to figure out like where you find these people mm -hmm. um, yeah i was about to ask you where do we find a supervisor <laughs> there, there's a really good um music supervisor summit that happens every year at the at canadian music week um, and I've done those roundtable discussions and it's literally like speed dating and you find out how they want to work. Um, you'll find out pretty quickly that music supervisors work very fast. They need slow, spooky for their specific thing. They need sounds like Lana Del Rey, you know, like, but they'll tell you it's a really good crash course on how they work. And then it's sort of like, you know, whether you want to do it or maybe you want to find a music publisher who wants to work with them. Music right, uh, music Supervisors Guild of Canada. Another good place to go uh, if you want to find out who these music supervisors are. Um, I've also spoken to people who have found music supervisors because they watch a show. And at the end, you'll always see the credits of who the music supervisor is. So that um, you, want, you can envision yourself playing, being on, uh, then it's good. And it's also good to just add names to your network if it's something you wanna do. Um, but I did want to come back to the renting and also give another perspective, which would be actually selling your song. You mentioned your friend wanting to rent this song, uh, but there are opportunities for you to be a songwriter, just a songwriter, and to be selling that song. Um, in some cases, you're, in most cases, you're selling that so song and retaining the copyright, but there are extreme situations where we call it ghostwriting, where you are selling the song and it's right. Um, and then as a songwriter or a publisher, whomever is negotiating that will price the, uh, because it's so valuable, will price that accordingly. If you're giving up your royalties and your copyright, the price is gonna go up substantially. Um, but if you're the songwriter behind it, you want to always, especially if you're new into the industry, you want to retain your copyright. You, you don't want to give up your percentages because it's so valuable. Yeah, what, what if it got like, you know, number one on the charts, yeah, you'd be you like, oh, yeah. totally. You never yeah. know. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. And it can be, you know, into, you could be in a wheelchair and you're now in your 80s and you're still making money off of that yeah. copyright they're performing because they were either not part of the writing process or they haven't retained their copyright. So they are, um, you know, Tom Jones being one of them, still still touring because you weren't really part of that writing process. And we want to encourage you while you're here. Some of you have already been listening and learning a lot already. And I see some questions pouring in, which we will ask in a few minutes, but I encourage you share the experience. This is knowledge that, that will help the industry altogether. So 
certainly share the experience. This is not private or else we wouldn't be going live right now. So um, I want to start asking some questions here that are coming in from the audience. Um, there was a question, I guess it was more of a clarification uh, from when Kezia was speaking earlier uh, about a producer getting 50% of royalties. Is, is that the case when someone writes a song or, or submits a song for registration? The songwriter gets 50%, the producer gets 50%. Is that, was that correct? It was someone was asking for clarification on that. So that would be, if we're looking at a pie um, and we are just looking at two people who are not represented by publishers then that pie would say traditionally that songwriting, the songwriting portion would be 50% and the production portion would be another 50%. Now I have been asked before, well, what if I write the melody line? Well, the melody line falls into the production bucket. So at that point you have a conversation with the producer and say, I wrote the melody line. You did all of the background and the bed tracks how are we going to work this if you again if it's collaborative and we are all we are both doing a, the same amount of work we can get 25 percent. but you're looking at the music non-lyric being one part one half and the lyric part being another half hmm. um so that brings another question sometimes there is a collaboration and the, the people collaborating have a a written in a written um agreement. If they have a written agreement about how the percentages are broken up, does that affect um, how the royalties are split up? For example, would that be something that's submitted to, for yes. example, SoCan? Yes. So that's actually what we use to be able to divide that royalty. So um, if a song is performed and we receive a license from it, and that is, let's say it's a live Hi. performance. And so let's say we got paid $100 just for uh, for argument's sake, if 50% was going to the songwriter and 50% to the producer, then the money that we generate from the license fee that we receive will then be divided by those into those two people. And each person, uh, assuming again that they did one song and that one song was written by two people, then each of them would get half. If we start performing other songs and other people are involved, then we take that $100 and we split it even further. If we are doing a cover, then that cover takes into consideration the person who wrote the cover song that you have performed and give them their due royalty. Great. Yes, I've heard of bands that sometimes have more than three members have done that with their royalties. They divided up five ways or four depending on members in the band. So that, yeah. that makes sense, yeah. yeah. It keeps things clean. Um, yeah. It doesn't always work out that way. Uh, nothing in the music industry is ever always the same. <laughs> uh, we work in an industry that has uh, many different facets and many different scenarios. Um, but that's why pieces of paper like that split sheet are so important um, because they do outline the, the portion of copyright that you're retaining. Um, and then as people progress further in their career, then they talk to the music publishers and the music publisher retains a portion also. Um, just jumping in here though, you don't need a music publisher um, at the beginning. You can just sign up your stuff right away with us. You can just become a member of CMRA and say you got a music publisher down the road. Um, we then just would take all your information and port it under the umbrella of your music publisher. We're very adept at music, like moving catalogs around. That is pretty normal. So um, you don't really have, you don't have to wait is what I'm trying to say. Thank well, you for clarifying good. that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, another question. How does CD Baby relate to CMRA and ReSound? Uh, I can take that first. Um, yeah. Uh, CD Baby is one of our clients. Um, you'll know CD Baby as a distributor, but they're also, they have this option called CD Baby Pro. Um, and CD Baby Pro is a publishing administrator. That means that they offer certain services for, um, but not all the services of a music publisher. Mm -hmm. So if you are totally lost, um, they're an example of someone who can do some of the administration for you. What they're doing on, on, on our side is that they are feeding the information from their platform into our systems. Um, 
and 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 then we are in turn taking that re uh, songwriting information and matching it to the recordings that we're getting um, from all the information that is streaming um, online or from the radio logs and then we pay out to them and then they pay out to you so they're sort of in in that scenario a middleman um, but you can use them just as an administrator um, or so as a distributor sorry uh, of, of your music to all of the services and you don't have to do the the pro option in that case you could just sign up with us and do the publishing side yourself but um, it really comes down to choices. Um, anytime you use, say, a music um, a publishing administrator, then you're saying a percentage is going to be taken off on their end for the work they're doing to liaise with us. Um, and so you're sort of you're losing more percentages by doing it that way. But at the same time, if you're not having a good, easy time navigating the industry, it might be the way to go at first. Um, just make sure that whatever you're signing up for, you know the terms, make sure you read everything, make mm -hmm. sure you know the um, geographical location that you're choosing. Um, a lot of the time, for instance, you can sign up with um, PRO, like, a, a, like SOCAN, and you can get them to collect your royalties around the world. But you could also just do it for Canada. So you have these choices all the way along. And, and this one, the CD Baby one is, is um, an example. There's another client of ours, Song Trust, that does the same thing. Um, so you, you've got some options. That's good news. Anyone else have to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to the resound side of it. Um, that's a really great description of what CD Baby does. Like basically they are a third party who who provides a service that you could do yourself, but maybe it's easier to let them do it for you. Um, one of the things that people often wonder about CD Baby is like, do you get royalties from from people like streaming music through the street, the sites that CD Baby distributes to? Um, and the answer is very complicated, but basically if something there are different types of streaming services and one is, one is fully interactive, semi-interactive and non-interactive. And so a, a really extreme example is like something that you can um, skip songs, make playlists on, um, you know, pause, fast forward, whatever, that's interactive, um, fully interactive. And then non-interactive would be like um, a radio show that is, rebroadcast online and you can't fast forward you can't do anything like it, you just have to listen to it straight um so those are examples of what those are um fully interactive streaming is considered um a sale it's a digital sale and so it's just paid out through the distributor so that's where a lot of times cd baby would come into play is that it's someone's distributor um and so sometimes people expect to see royalties for that, um, not knowing that it's actually just considered a digital sale and it's coming through as a sale. Um, and the streaming rate in Canada is extremely low right now, uh, something that definitely everyone wants to work on getting better. Um, so a lot of lobbying at the government level for that. Um, but essentially that's what it is. The other thing that um, CD Baby does is issues ISRCs, which are um, International Standard Recording Code, <laughs> um, which is a unique uh, identifier for us recording. Um, and CD Baby can issue those for you and often uh, people will get them through CD Baby and pay for them, but you don't have to pay for them. You can get them for free through um, Connect Music, which is one of the uh, administrators of ISRCs in Canada. And it's really, really easy. You just fill out a form and you get it like five minutes later. All right, so I just want to remind everybody just one more time, thank you for joining us. We are like three quarters of the way through. Uh, we are. Um, doing the Hub Online presented by the GMI Hub. And we are so glad that you joined us tonight because this conversation has been ongoing and, and we're just scratching the surface. It's amazing. Uh, 
We have, um, let me just recap of who we have. We have Kazia, Kazia Meyerson, she's here. Rebecca Webster is here. And we have Emma uh, Julia, J Julius, I believe this is right, Julius? Yeah. Okay, and you know, the, the, these three ladies are representing uh, um, amazing um, companies that will help you as an artist or, or as a musician or a writer to take your song to the place where you're able to make some income perhaps and maybe even get the playability in different locations and places that, that you want to be represented in your music. So um, thank you for joining us. And another thing that, that we'd like for you to do is uh, tell people about this, share the experience. Um, if you want to find out more about the interviews we had in the past, just head up to our YouTube channel, the GMI Hub, and you will see some amazing um, past uh, interviews that you, you, you just can't pass up. It's just going to be amazing. So thank you again for joining us. Um, more questions from the audience, if I can uh, try and squeeze those in. Um, one question that came in is, do we need to register? I was talking about registering with uh, music. Um, with... Uh, sound scan and BDS as well. Does that ring a bell with anybody? I'll be honest, I don't know them, so. <laughs> Kezia, you look like you know this one. I just know this. Nielsen Sound Scan is the um, chart uh, operator. Um, they, they provide data to the music industry. Um, usually, I think that would be generated. Um, so if you have a record label, they would be registering um, your songs. Um, what Emma said earlier, um, to get your songs registered, you would want to get that ISRC number. Um, so you'd want to, if you don't have a record label, you would go to connect and do that. So, um, sound scan is something that, um, is tracking, um, the metadata that from all of the platforms. So what you should be doing is making sure that you have the correct information that identifies your song as your song so that um, if all of a sudden you have a huge breakout hit um, that they can be getting that information from the um, various streaming and radio um, plays that are happening. Um, they have a formula for uh, how they're calculating traction in the, in, in the industry. Um, and the only way it's going to work is if you have good data in your song. So um, mm. if you've ever actually clicked on, uh, say if you're in iTunes and you click on the song and you've got all the data behind it, and it's like, what album is it from? All these things. You can fill in a lot of fields there and you'll see there's all sorts of things like ISRC, all these things. Um, those, that's, that's what they're going to, that's a simple way of explaining what they're what they're looking for and what they're tracking. So to register for that, they would have to also register with Connect to them to do that to get that IR uh, ISRC number. Yeah, you should be speaking with Connect for sure um, to make sure because I think you need don't you need Emma you need ISRC codes to generate the product is is similar to um, an identifier or a barcode uh, that follows your sound recording. Um, and Nielsen SoundScan, as uh, Rebecca just said, is tracking. So what they do is, in some cases, they are tracking real numbers um, uh, from, let's say, a digital platform. However, if it's a radio station, they often do censuses. And that census will happen once every 30 days where they will grab a, a, a amount of data and filter that data. Now, there are some radio stations that don't report or they're not part of the reporting of Nielsen SoundScan. So, you know, I'll give you an example. Like G98.7, for instance, doesn't report to uh, Nielsen SoundScan. So if your song is playing heavily on G98.7, it's great for your, your, um, for your network. It's great for your audience. However, it won't show up in a Nielsen SoundScan, SoundScan data report. Yeah, no, when I worked in radio for about 18 years and we did SOCAN and it was random. They didn't tell us when they were going to drop out on us when we had to write every single producer record. It was crazy. Yeah, so I, I know what that's all about. I didn't enjoy it, by the way. It's uh, 365 days now, by the way. It's not random what? anymore. That's really good news, actually, for artists because... Yeah, that's true. Um, because before it would just be like, hopefully your track gets played in that two weeks that they're reporting. Yeah. 365 day reporting so that's a huge huge win well for i guess that's everybody. 
that's better in a sense because then the the, rec the music producer could actually have the sheets ready to go every day so that it's probably better yeah sure. that's the importance if you're starting or if you are recording that's the importance of the metadata so that once it goes to radio and then once it transfers over to nielsen that they have the correct information so it can be tracked appropriately and this is where those top 10 top 20 top 40 lists come about through, through there these. are many lists. Um, yeah. Lists are based on genre. Lists are based on being in Canada. Lists are based. There's um, when I get a Nielsen SoundScan report um, on a monthly basis, and there are categories of all of this data that they're collecting. Um, mm. So it's good to even look at it to see what categories there are and who's on the charts. And you know, it, it's a it's a good it's a good win for sure. It's also, yeah. um, I, I chair a committee at the Juno Awards and um, that, that sort of data is calculated into um, the various uh, popularity ratings of, um, of the nominees in the end. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, you don't have to be a member of Connect Music to get an ISRC. Um, you just have to go to Connect's website. It's, so it's just that Connect administers it, but you don't have to be a member. Mm -hmm. um, and you just go to connect and then the tab that says ISRC on the website and it's it's all there. Oh, cool. That's helpful. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, another question. Do you have time? Yes, we do. I have time for one more, another question. Um, if a singer is performing on Facebook, do they fill out paperwork? Uh, sorry, just a second. Paperwork for like the covers or the originals that they are doing. In other words, do they have to do this all in advance? From my perspective, uh, Facebook is a platform that uh, CMRA already licenses for, and, and so no, there's no paperwork on my side. Um, that might change uh, on the performance side, though. Yeah, I think for that program that I was mentioning earlier, Encore, you do have to provide a set list um, so that they just know which songs to pay out on. Awesome. You can always do that after. That's exactly where I was going. I was like, and there's Encore, but it's been covered. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so Encore. Yeah, I was just saying Encore is that, is that um, when you're talking about, say, Facebook, we're just talking about that scenario, Facebook music services they have. What does Encore do with that? So How Encore is, is a... Um, Encore is a program that SoCan has initiated in light of the fact that there aren't live performances. And so what they're looking at are, um, in order to qualify at least, at least 10 concerts. And then those 10 concerts have to have a minimum of 100 viewers. And then as per each concert, you're looking at up to $150 per vi uh, virtual concert. And uh, so we would require, um, it's similar to any actual live performance, we always wanna see those set lists. We call them NLMPs. Um, and those set lists help to let us connect money to music, but then also divide appropriately that money to anybody, any song that has been performed or work that has been performed and the rightful copyright owners. I'm processing all of this information right now. I'm going to be replaying this video over <laughs> and, and over hey, no, and over I'm making, again. <laughs> I'm making some notes. Like, this is great. No, okay. I, seriously, ladies, this information is invaluable because uh, I know there are people out there right now going, what? Well, I could do that? I didn't know I could do that. You know? So that's, that's amazing. That's where we want to be. We want to be able to give information to people that are in that place where they're looking. And uh, it's just a pleasure to have you. Um, we have a few more minutes left. Do you have a question online there or do you have a question? Because I have a wrap-up question. I have a question, another one from the audience. Okay. Um, if, if one has ever, has never signed up their song, they've never signed up and they've, uh, for, um, or registered their songs, I guess, and now they want to sign up. Will they ever get back paid, especially if their song been, has been used or performed or sung or whatever, but they've never registered their song. So how does that work? Is there such a thing as back paying in this case or? Sure. So we, I, I have some really good news for this person. Awesome. Um, so because CMRA is, was the one to um, negotiate the tariffs for the streaming platforms from the inception. So from 2004, when they launched in Canada, um, if you signed up tomorrow, um, we can retroactively 
um, claim all of those that those royalties um, for you back to day one. Um, so you're not the only reason that's possible is because the way we work is that um, once we have your song information in our big music library, then we can go, we match it, we, we invoice the services, and then they come back and pay us within 30 days, and then we, we pay out. Um, if we were just sitting on the money, we wouldn't be able to do that, but because we're not, um, we're able to. So back to day one. Um, there are certain lines of business, like YouTube and Facebook, um, they time out after a couple of years, but um, for online streaming, good news. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome news. <laughs> For ReSound, um, in ReSound's case, for um, neighboring rights, there are closeout periods that are coming up soon, and there's a schedule on our website as to when those periods are closing out. Um, but basically, um, right now, I think the next period that's closing is like the window of 1998 to 2008 or something like that. So you've still got a lot of time. Um, and that's... Uh, Oh, sorry. Yeah, 1998 to 2000 for um, performers is closing on September 1st. And on September 1st for makers, I'm just looking at the website right now, 2009 to 2016. So, um, you know, from that whole period, if it has generated income, um, there's a strong chance that we're still holding it and you can come claim it. Um, and you just have to submit your repertoire and then get that sorted out but so so if there's something that is very old that you haven't um ever registered um you might want to check that out soon but like if something got played if you released a track today and it got played on the radio today um you're not going to lose out from not having it registered immediately with resound that's amazing but it is a good idea to re register it as soon as you release it. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. So again, not so, um, not so uh, wonderful in terms of news. Uh, we have a two year cap. And um, however, if the song was big enough that it was generating a lot of income um, and we couldn't find, so we have what we call a royalty, royalty trackers and those royalty trackers look we receive money we see that there's a big concert that happened but we can't find or we're receiving money from a radio station and we can't find that songwriter um, or we will hold on to that money for um, a long period of time especially like I can think of one instance where um, it was an indigenous youth and there was tens of thousands of dollars um, that was sitting there. So it's not that money wasn't going away. Um, but the rule of thumb is to make sure that you register all your songs, but then all of your live performances immediately after or within the year, because after two years, because of SoCan's uh, non-for-profit status, we need to make sure that, that that money is used elsewhere or given to mm. um, distributed amongst other um, members yeah Fantastic. something that maybe you posted up on soundcloud and you just never claimed for it then you should do that right away and yeah. well always do it you know it, it, it does i it got does. a whole bunch of stuff on soundcloud i should probably do that yeah i mean like people don't people always think spotify or like yeah you know, yeah but but like every streaming platform that that's licensed in canada we work with them so all right, so last question I'd like to ask, because we are almost out of time. If you had one thing that you would like to just to say to somebody who's just got, you just heard their song and you went, that's a good song. What would be the one thing you would tell them? What was the one thing or maybe two things that you would like to tell them? Just, this is my advice right now, you need to do this. I would, I would say um, learn as much as you can, listen as much as you can and ask a lot of questions because the field of rights and royalties is very nuanced. So um, even me, I've been immersed in it for a little bit now, you're always learning that things are changing. And um, so it's not a problem to keep asking questions because um, it will probably result in you getting paid a little bit more for the creative work that you've already made. So that's my advice. 
for sure. Um, and beyond that, I would remind whomever that this is a business. And so if you want to make this your business or your livelihood, then you have to take it seriously. So asking those questions, reaching out to experts, um, calling all of the different collectives and really honing in just like you would in school on a homework project, figure you like look at it in a perspective as this, I'm the brand. And now that I have this product, how am I going to market it? How am I going to make money from it? How am I going to distribute it? Um, and immerse yourself in those various streams of income so that you can um, hopefully sit at home and write songs for the rest of your life. <laughs> Great advice, Emma. Um, I guess my advice that would be different to either of those, because those are great pieces of advice also, is to register your rep repertoire. <laughs> um, not only because it's great for you, but it's also great for um, the organizations who represent that repertoire, whether it's SOCAN or CMRA or Resound or Connect or any of the organizations that um, are out there. It helps us lobby for better rights to represent more repertoire. So um, when we go to the Copyright Board of Canada and say, you know, we need better streaming rates or we need better um, rates for the use of music in nightclubs or bowling alleys or whatever it is, the more repertoire we represent, the better case we can make for that because we say, look at all these people who uh, are creators and who deserve to make a living off of their art. So, um, so yeah, it's good for everybody to keep your repertoire up to date. Thank you, Emma. That's amazing. Uh, well, I've enjoyed this uh, evening with you uh, a lot. You know, I, uh, I'm going to state the obvious. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the token male here tonight, but I've, uh, I've enjoyed this very much. The conversation has been informative. It's been a uh, wisdom that's been able to share with all you viewers. And I hope that you take these, uh, these points and made some notes because there's a lot there and maybe even have to watch this video again, because there's lots to chew on. And uh, so, um, on behalf of the GMI Hub, I want to thank you, all three of you, Rebecca, Emma, and Kazia. You're awesome, very much. And I also want to thank you viewers for tuning in and sharing this experience. We will be um, uh, posting this on our YouTube channel, GMI Hub. So certainly, uh, you know, feel free to review this particular um, webcast or this episode again and again because yes it is loaded with information and i and as dale said earlier we've only scratched the surface mm -hmm. there is so much more i wish i could just kind of book these ladies right now <laughs> for another session because mm -hmm. because there's just so much more that i know we need to unpack but viewers thank you so much for tuning in and we're here every week. We're here every Monday. So we will be back next week with uh, Studio Talk. We have three guests that are going to be talking more about microphones and, and some little tips and tricks on what you can do to get your microphone to sound even like the most expensive microphones. Mm -hmm. But there'll be more details on that. Um, but we also want to remind you of the this month there is a, a special um, uh, a 25% discount on, well, if you want to invest in your performance, On Stage Success is offered a 25% discount on their services. If you want the discount code, please go to uh, gospelmusicindustryhub.com and send your email to us and we will get that code to you. For now, we just want to say thank you for joining us and come back to us next week. And remember, Gospel Music Industry Hub encourages unity, community, mentorship, and talent growth. Have a good night, guys. Bless you all. Bye.